the act of homeschooling is an act of decentralizing your, your um, the process of educating your child's mind. Um, because one size does not fit all. Making sure that you maintain control um, and an understanding of what your child's needs are and to do it on your own terms, rather than delegating that to the Department of Education. So I just want to let you guys know you showed up like uh, five, six, seven years too late for for me. You know, I <laughs> my kids grew up here and we were always looking for educational opportunities and uh, they were kind of pretty sparse. So I'm uh, a little bit jealous to hear that you guys are, are here now and kind of trying to provide the these educational opportunities for, for the Bitcoiners that are moving down to El Salvador. Um, and we'll we'll dive more into that, but I just want to get that out front that, that I'm a little you know a little irked that you uh, well, we'll you waited till my kids were about ready to graduate. So we'll be here for grandchildren. Not that I okay. want to put that on your yeah, plate yeah, anytime that's, soon. That's, hopefully, that's a long long yeah. way off. <laughs> so I have my my daughter just started. She's a freshman university, and and my son is uh, he's a junior at uh, the international school. Okay. So. If so he needs help with those college essays, I do test prep and consulting on that too. Perfect. Do you do a SAT test I, prep? I just finished an SAT prep okay. right before I came. All right. Well, uh, we, we might be giving you a call then. That sounds that's good. A, that's good to know. So before we delve into all that, um, what, why, why are you here in El Salvador? What's What was the path that brought you guys here? Um, I'm assuming you weren't born here. So No. Um, for me, the opportunity to teach the way that I want to teach without pushback from either schools, administration, government schools, or even the homeschool community in the States. It's kind of a blank slate down here in a way that people appreciate a classical education. And that's what I teach. So it's an so give opportunity. Us a little, yeah, give us a little background yeah, on sure. what, what brought you to that. I think you were a college professor before. I was. So I, um, I was a college professor in Los Angeles. I did that for a long time. I was a professor of humanities. So pretty much the pretty parts of history, although I also taught history, uh, Western Civ and world history primarily when I taught history. And I have a background in anthropology, so I taught that. I used to do archaeology in Egypt a million lifetimes ago. And so um, all of that kind of rolled in together. I love um, teaching the classics, classic literature. Those have always been my closest friends since I was a young girl. And um, my research is in late antiquity, the fall of Rome, which is kind of another reason why we're in El Salvador, not in America. <laughs> um, and, we'll, have, we'll have to get into that. Yeah. <laughs> So that's kind of my story. Um, I just wanted to teach what I wanted to teach in an environment where people were open and accepting and the Bitcoiners from everything that I've encountered, they're very receptive to that because they want their kids to learn to think, to reason, and they don't want to deal with the indoctrination, at least from what I'm seeing. So I think earlier you said that, that you guys were originally living in, well, if you're teaching in LA, I'm assuming yeah. you're living in that area. And then how did you get from there to, to here? Was it a straight path down or? It was and, anything and Joel, but straight. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we took a very circuitous path to get here. We left Los Angeles uh, in large part because of Deanna's experience with her college becoming much more um, um, academically corrupt, uh, would you say? That's and, a good, yeah, that's a and, nice way of putting it. And I think, uh, you know, with your background in, um, in classical Western thought, you left before you were probably going to get fired anyway. I would have gotten so fired. So what, what were the pressures? Like, what were they pushing you? To? Was it like a, a dumbing down of the curriculum? Was it 
just being woke throughout everything? What what were the biggest things that all you of, felt? All of the above. So I rewrote my tests every semester. One, I like a challenge. I don't want to be easily bored. Another thing is that um, I was I taught classes in humanities on ancient Greece and Rome and had students complaining of why I didn't have any African Americans literature or anything in my class. I had to explain to them about the chronology that ancient Greece and Rome is in, you know, 3000 BC. And here we are, founding of America in 1776, the discovery of America, which you can't really say, um, in, you know, the 15th century. And that anything that was African-American came much later, but it wasn't good enough. And it was just going to be a matter of time. I also taught works that I had to hide in my office, honestly. I taught Anthem by Ayn Rand. And um, I had students complain about that. So it was just going to be a matter of time. I That, that was, I, I think I read Anthem, actually in junior high, I had yeah. a teacher assign it. And I became a very big Ayn Rand fan. Um, later in life, I, I have some more qualms and you know, nuances with some of the things, but I mean, just amazing. Right. But at least you can have a conversation about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I that was one of the first books I had my kids read. I was, nice. Yeah. So I mean, yes. in an academic <clears throat> setting, that just wasn't going to happen. You you're more likely to uh, lose, if not your job, then at least the status you've accumulated in a career. Yeah, it's true. And back up a little bit while I was still at the college, I was very much in leadership positions as a professor. I um, headed up our student learning objectives. I was the distance ed coordinator. So I did all of these things. I uh, sat on statewide committees for the community college district. And so I thought I could fix things from within. So I went and got my doctorate in education. And I realized that I couldn't. So six months after I got my doctorate, I gave my notice at the college. And my doctorate was actually about intellectual diversity because they made me do a diversity topic. And I said, sure, I'll do intellectual diversity. I had a hard time finding someone to chair my committee until they hired a new professor. And he um, was from Utah, Mormon. So he chaired my committee and I got my degree, but I used Ayn Rand as my data point. So, and I used critical race theory, turned it on its head and used it for intellectual diversity and people who did not have the woke thinking, they were my marginalized community. So it was kind of fun, actually. Yeah, I just, I just want to underline that um, for the, the genius trolling that's involved with that. Uh, she used the, you know, the, the maxim of critical race theory is looking for the marginalized community and, um, and turning it on its head and, or at least uh, elevating them to, um, you know, uh, victimhood status. And, what Deanna did was to use professors who taught Ayn Rand as a marginalized community for her academic dissertation. It was fun. I wasn't popular I'm in the sure, college. I'm sure that but went over fun. real well. <laughs> it did, but it was fun. Yeah, so I left and then. Um, do you want to finish our long? Well, I mean, story? we. We were, you know, basically because of Deanna being an academic refugee at this point. Um, it turns out we have family in Seattle and we, we looked at that as a way to kind of escape for, from the, um, from what California has become, Almost but we Seattle. moved to Seattle. <laughs> so that was where our you thinking were a brought down. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, I wanted a white Christmas. What can I say? Yeah. Uh, no, but we had family. We we lived um, very close to my family, and you know we spent four years there. But COVID happened, and and really the lockdowns happened, and that's what really made us want to leave because of how um, repressive it got, and not just repressive. It changed the culture of the city around us. So. We found that people were just becoming what um, what a lot of blue cities have become. They they became a lot less responsive to basic human contact. They they treated you as some kind of disease vector, and we realized that that was not the life we wanted. So we moved to Florida to 
try to find a different kind of culture. And we loved it in there. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we spent two years there and it was a very happy two years. Yeah. Uh, it was good timing because it, yeah. it was, uh, it was yeah, yeah, we were very happy to life, be there. Life yeah. went on. I remember going to the Bitcoin conference there and I think it was 21. And I was like, wow, like, I know. this is just normal. Like people are being normal. It here. was it was crazy yeah. as we left Seattle. Well, Joel did mention El Salvador when we were looking to leave Seattle, but I wasn't quite ready to move abroad yet. And that was because of, of because Bitcoin. of Bitcoin and what we'd heard about Bitcoin Beach. Okay. Yeah. And so um, but we moved to Florida uh, as we drove out of Seattle. As soon as we left those really Western states, things got freer. We saw fewer masks and it was really interesting. We could go into a museum. I remember being in Dodge City, Kansas without a mask and it was fine and no one was freaking out. And I was like, oh, it's so nice now. It's it's so insane. I mean, yeah. looking back on that now, just how crazy people got. But the real crazy thing is most of them still haven't acknowledged it. They they forget that that's how they were, or they or they're I still don't think that they, somehow, way. Yeah. Some of yeah. them are still that way. I, I mean, don't think they've forgotten. I think they are too ashamed to admit that how wrong they were. I don't even know if they're ashamed though. I don't I don't know if they've admitted to themselves how insane that was. I think they're cognitively ashamed. I think they just can't look in the mirror and and really accept what they've done, so they try to block it out of their minds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I'm going to derail you a little bit okay. from we'll get back Absolutely. to your your story, but <clears throat> but I I want to get your take on higher education. I know you've you've moved, but I'm just curious as as coming from that field as I have a a daughter now who's a, a freshman. She's going to Westmont College in Santa Barbara um, and a son that's that's two years away. And a lot of people in the Bitcoin community are kind of anti-college education now that, you know, you don't need that. You can, you know, just learn how to program on your own or do something else that it's kind of a waste of time and a waste of money. I definitely don't think that. I look back on on my college days. I went to a, the liberal arts college, and and even though I came out and did a business that wasn't directly connected, it just gave me this ability to think. It gave me this network of lifelong friends that are still involved with ventures with. It, um, it gave me the love to travel through a Europe semester program we had that you know, I probably wouldn't be in El Salvador. Right. If it wasn't, I mean, really Bitcoin Beach wouldn't exist if I hadn't gone to university. Like it set the stage for all these things. It gave me desire to to think outside the box and do things differently. So that's my take. But I'm curious as somebody who's come from that field, what what do you advise people? What's your take? Would you say, no, it is a waste and keep your kids out. They're going to just She's ready to them. pounce right now. <clears throat> he knows me so well. Um May I respectfully ask what year you graduated? I graduated in 97, I believe, if I'm doing the math right. So that's almost 30 years ago. I'm sorry to bring that up at this point in the such terms. Yes, yes. Things have no, changed old, a lot in that. 30 years. Well, so am I. <clears throat> but th things have changed a lot in 30 years. I, I agree, and... but I went I went back. We went back, you know, because yeah. my daughter's actually going to the same school that okay. we went to. And so... We did some extensive tours and spent time with professors. And I, I was impressed at how it was interesting because when I went there, Westmont's a small Christian mm -hmm. liberal arts college. Yeah. When I went there, the professors were much more liberal than the students. I feel like the professors are about the same, but you did notice the student body is more liberal now than the professors. That, But I feel like the university itself has yeah. kind of held the line and is still... So my thing with that is, and this goes all the way down to K through 12, accreditation. Accreditation is linked to government. Government is linked to whatever they want to be in that accreditation. So now you have DEI everywhere, um, the diversity, equity, inclusion. Mm -hmm. You have all of these like sort of what I call admin bloat positions. And those are tied to accreditation. The, accredit the college, if it's accredited, which I'm sure it is, because that's how they are able to get their degrees out. That's how yeah. they can, you know, get the financial aid and all of those things. The accrediting board sets the boundaries and the accrediting board is tied to the government and the government is tied to the Department of Ed and the Department of Ed is absolutely morally corrupt. Irredeemably corrupt. And so with that said, 
if you have a child who wants to be a doctor or a lawyer or a certain engineering or whatever the case may be, a prof- they need to go to college. However, if they're not sure what they want to do, I would say take a gap year, go travel. Although traveling is, you know, post it's better now, but we'll see what happens. Um, I would also recommend that you vet the college in a way that you're looking at the syllabi and you're looking at the student body and you just do tons of research to find out what protests are going on there. What speakers are they allowing to go to the college? Because if they're not allowing speakers from both sides, then there's nothing to, there's no reasoning there anymore. And that's academia today. They're not interested in thought and in debate and those things. And so I don't think they're places of learning any longer. I don't recommend college. And I think that's why we were felt good about her going yeah. to, to Westmont because they they still engage there in are, those things. Yeah, they there are, are some really good yeah. like Hillsdale and there are there's one up in um, Idaho and I can't remember the name of it, but I have a friend whose son is going there. And I did a lot of research for her. And there are still little pockets. Yeah. So it's likely high, that's one of them. We have <clears throat> excuse me. We have high hopes for a new college in Florida. Um, that appears to be um, returning to earlier standards. But really what's happening is just an utter, almost Maoist corruption of colleges. And when you speak of how the student body of, of your particular school is different from the, um, uh, from the professors, uh, that comes back to another issue that uh, Deanna can speak to this, is the, the need to reach students at an earlier age, because a lot of this indoctrination has been hitting students at much earlier ages than it used to. And that's why we're in the the serious yeah. mess we are in today. Well, I think that, that that's why COVID was such a wake up call for parents, because they were seeing the stuff that their kids were being taught or not taught a lot of times. Yeah. Um, it's interesting too, even hearing from the university, say, they said that they have to have much more, and, and it's a it's a pretty challenging university to, or college to get into the one that my daughter's going to. But they said even at that level, people that are getting, you know, 13, 1400 on their SAT come in and don't know how to write papers because they weren't in class these last few years. And so it's, they've seen yeah. they've said that the the caliber of the students in the classroom and their ability to, to think critically has really gone down. Um, I she's she was got it, and I'm going to brag a little bit about her right now. But she got into their honors program. It's nice. called the Augustinian program, and they they study writers like Augustine, and and they're really like focused on the and critical thinking and bringing in different perspectives. And I think part of the reason they wanted her to participate was because she grew up in El Salvador and has a different perspective on that. So, so how do you? Ah, if you're saying that that doesn't exist anymore, I still think that that's very important. I think learning, I think the liberal arts and a lot of people in Bitcoin, the oh, liberal arts, but I think that ability to think and reason critically is is critical. So where do you advise people to get that? Because I don't think you get that in other environments. Homeschool, you bring it to them. That's why I'm a homeschool advocate now. I left the system. So I was publicly educated all up everywhere. I got two master's degrees. I got all of this stuff, all through public education. And I finally went to my first private school for my doctorate. And so I, I, it sounds hypocritical because I had a good education. My mom made sure she moved. We moved around a lot, but every time we moved, she made sure we were in the right district. She cared. Education was very important. First generation college student, she wanted to give us what she didn't have, my sister and I. And so it was just always primary that we, you know, took education seriously. We had books in the home. We had, my mom was a voracious reader. My dad didn't read anything, but she read Harlequin romances. For some reason, I was this weird kid that loved the classics. So I'd go to the library and I'd read all the classic literature. And um, so leading by example, reading the classics, keeping your kids curious, schools beat it out of them. I mean, think about it. Yeah. You have a school and the kids are all sitting there for 45 minutes and they're studying history. You have little Johnny who loves what you're studying. 
He's so fascinated by the Middle Ages. He wants to learn all about the Crusades and the Knights, and that's very cool. The bell rings. Okay, Johnny, put your book away. Johnny's sad because he wants to keep reading about the Crusades and the Knights and all of this really cool stuff that he loves. But no, he's got to put his book away and do something that he doesn't want to do. It kills curiosity. They learn to be obedient. I mean, this goes back to Prussia, right? We can, I can bore you all night with the history of education. I'll spare you. So disobedience and doing those things, it kills curiosity. So the best thing I think that parents can do is to homeschool. Whether, and, yeah. And, and that fits with, and, and the reason we're on a Bitcoin podcast is that that fits with this message of decentralization. Uh, the, the act of homeschooling is an act of decentralizing your, your um, the process of educating your child's mind. Um, because one size does not fit all. When you bring your children to these uh, to a, a typical modern education um, to a, a schoolroom, they're locked in a room with thirty of their peers, or so, and uh, and they are taught to obey what is essentially an authoritarian environment. You. Um, educate them yourself and you know who they are and you find out what size fits them. So I see the parallels of centralization versus decentralization running through um, education as well. So I have mixed feelings about homeschool. I, I was homeschooled a couple <clears throat> stints growing up. Um, it always sounded great when we started and yeah. Um, yes, we would get our schoolwork done and I, and I was, was always a good student and, and, but I was bored. I missed, missed my friends. And right. so, um, after a while my mom would give up and, and put us back in, in school. And, and I, I felt like I got a, a decent education. You know, I went to private school when I was young, public mm -hmm. school later on, um, never really saw an issue with that. And then with my own kids, mostly because we moved to, to El Salvador when we were in the U.S. and they were very young. They went to a charter school that we were pretty happy with um, that I think they went two days a week and they homeschooled the other three days. And then here we did kind of a combination of homeschool and then there's a, a, a little local school here in the community, yeah. Escuela Libre. We always called it the hippie school. <laughs> and so our, our kids would go there for two days a week to do like art and theater and gardening. And then my wife would do, you know, English and math and those things because they, we wanted to be a little more regimented than, right. than they were. They had, you know, a, a little bit different idea of they wanted to be kind of looser. And that was, you know, we just want to make sure that our kids could go on to, to university and to, that they would have, um, What's the word I'm looking for? The, the grades, the the transcripts. transcripts that they would have transcripts because we had, you know, heard some horror stories from other people who didn't have transcripts, right. and then they tried to put their kids in school and they wouldn't let them because they didn't have transcripts. And so by the time, and so that worked okay for us. The the kids liked it, but when they got to high school, they're like, "We want to go to real school," <laughs> and so for us that meant. They had to wake up at 4.30 every day here in El Zante, wow. leave by 5.30 to be to school in the capital city. And then, you know, so they're spending three hours in the community That's today, but it was still worth it to them because we kept asking, are you sure you want to do this? And they're like, so for them, the the social aspect, the the camaraderie, the, the being in school was worth, I mean, how many kids are going to get up at 4.30 every right. morning to, to get to school? And and they went to two different schools uh, in uh, San Salvador. So my daughter went to the American school and my son is at the international school. And and we've been actually very pleased overall with the level of education they've gotten that's there. Great. I mean, that's obviously we know that, um, you know, that's a luxury that a lot of people can't afford. And to, to be able to put right. your kids in, uh, in a private school like that is not comparing apples to apples. But for me, I still think that was the best for our kids. And my, my wife was a, was a teacher. She taught science. Yeah. Um, it, it was, but the kids were like, no, we want to be in school. And 
So, so how would you respond? I mean, are you a like hardcore advocate? You think it's best for everybody or what's, what's your response to that? I do think that? it's best for everybody. However, I have an answer to the socialization and all of those things. It's called the homeschool co-op. And that's something that I'm trying to bring that mindset down here where families get together and they educate the kids together. So if you have a family whose mom was a science teacher like your wife, and you have another family who maybe they're an engineer, so now you have a science teacher and you have a math teacher. Mm -hmm. And then someone like me who has a background in history and art history, and um, you know I teach writing, I teach reading, I could fill in those subjects. So you start pulling families together, and then you have a school and each, parent teaches one class, the kids are there, they share things, you know, they're going from class to class, and they're doing this as early as kindergarten. So it's almost that model of middle school where they start changing classes, but it's all the way through. So you have somebody that knows how to paint, you have somebody who does early child care, blah, blah, blah. So you have everything covered, but it takes, a, you know, this a group of committed individuals that are willing to donate an hour or two a week to teach a whole bunch of kids. And so the homeschool co-op fixes that. Yeah. And, and I think that's what I'm trying to bring down here. And that's something I tried to do initially, but I've realized my expertise. I can teach from second grade all the way to high school. That's what I focus on now. I'm a private teacher. I teach writing, reading, art history, history, pretty much what, you know, if it's in my wheelhouse, I'll teach it. And um, but here the families are younger. So there's a lot of younger kids, and that's out of my purview. We need some early educators. There's one in San Blas right now. Um, her name's Hannah. She's doing an amazing job. We need, like, a few more Hannahs. And then we need a place for there to be a school. Because working out of our homes is okay, but it's not optimal when we, all of a sudden, there are 20 kids. Yeah. And so, you know, there are logistic things that can be worked out. It just takes a little bit of time. And but, I think there's more opportunity now with the demographic that's here. When when absolutely. my kids were growing up yeah. here, there there were no other kids to to do the co-op with. There right. was, you know, maybe one or two, but they were even older than them. So they were always the oldest. So it was kind of, you know, times it would be just kind of lonely for them. Which, which Definitely. I think I and that makes absolute sense. And if it works for your family to do what you've done and go to the schools, that's great. Do what's right for your family and your kids. That's my biggest message. Rarely do I think that is government schools because of what's happening, at least in the States. Like I'm American. So yeah. I know what's going on there. I know what's going on in some places in Europe. So just be cognizant of what's being taught, what your kids are learning, how they're coming home and shaming their parents <laughs> and you don't want to go Sh through that. Shaming their parents. Yeah. Like, in, in kindergarten, okay, so the Romans had this system called the trivium, where you have the grammar phase, elementary, grammar school, you have the logic phase, middle school, and you have the rhetoric phase, high school. And that mirrors the cognitive development of a human being. So in the grammar phase, you pump them full of information. That's where they're getting all the facts, all the information. All their vocabulary. Yeah, everything, mm -hmm. right? I'm learning Spanish right now. I'm in the grammar phase. I'm a preschooler right now, unfortunately. But your your brain isn't quite as neuroplastic as uh, you know. Yeah, that's why that's why we yeah. learn later in life. Yeah. It's a lot harder. It's very difficult. Yeah. Um, but that's at that phase of their lives, though they are able to absorb all this information. You've seen it with your kids, yeah. I'm sure. You just give them like they'll memorize all the capitals, all the cities in the world, geography, and they'll they'll know all, they'll learn all about the dinosaurs and every single dinosaur. But that's what that's what this um, age is for, to just absorb information. Well, my my daughter was was probably like you. She was a voracious reader. I was a voracious reader too. We didn't yeah. have TV growing up, and so like I had a love for books. But my daughter would just plot like we gave her the unabridged Les Mes to to. Oh, nice. I mean, she wow. read the whole thing because we could <clears throat> not keep books in stock. She would yeah. just burn through them. Now <laughs> now she's like. Um, I don't know anybody who's read Unabridged Les Mis. She's like, she's it was read like, the chapters about the French sewers. It was like 40, she's like, it was like 40 pages on the silverware. Yeah. It, it I was love like, that. I so loved it. It was, uh, the difference yeah. So between I understand the two what you're of us is that I skip the, the, those chapters and she reads the whole thing. I relish, I just love it. It's like reading Mrs. Dalloway. Yeah. It's so fascinating. <laughs>
But you were saying, though, about um, about the phases, yeah, right? Yeah, so, so then in middle school, you get to logic, and then they're going to start piecing this, all this information that they've learned, they're going to start putting it together and coming up with like little baby analysis and trying to think. And then in high school, that's when they get argumentative, right? You have children that age. Oh, yeah. And they want to argue. But They that's don't wait till high school. It but starts that's, in junior high. <clears throat> but that's because their brain is like starting to really think in more abstract yeah. terms. And so when you t give a kindergartner all of this information about either gender or the environment, they or race or race, they cannot cognitively understand it. It's it's beyond them. And I'm not trying to be mean to children. It's just the way the human yeah. brain develops. And so what happens is that they become they're indoctrinated. They're told to memorize this, this is good, this is bad, and I'm gonna shove this information in you. They go home and they tell their parents, you threw that can away. Why did you throw that can away? You're gonna kill the earth. And they're repeating talking points, like they've watched the news and they're just repeating talking points. That is child abuse in my mind. That is absolute abuse. It's abuse to the child, it's abuse to the family, it's abuse to the parents. So homeschool, in the world of education, particularly in America, and you're getting that in private schools, really good private schools. It's happening, like $50,000 a year for high school private schools. It's there, I've seen it. I yeah. have for, you know, secondhand evidence, but like there is definite evidence that it's there. The more elite the school is now, the worse it is, because um, in order to maintain their elite status, they will hire from the best teachers' colleges. And the teachers' colleges, as we have eyewitness um, proof, uh, I, someone who's actually seen the corruption, um, that is where a lot of these horrific Maoist ideas uh, originally spread. So all of this, um, all of what we're talking about here, the indoctrination at young ages, this is all intentional from um, this ideological Maoist Marxist movement. It's really so, a so page do, from Marx. Who do you think is is driving that? So it's... I mean, I'm one of those people that mm. just thinks, no, they're not that smart. This is just they're stupid and they're indoctrinated themselves and they're just this repeating goes back what to they're the 100 saying. true. 170 years of educational history. I mean, so we can start pinpointing. Um, I like to, to, to play this game with philosophy. Um, I love philosophy. So we go back and we're like, okay, there's Paulo Freire. And he said that education should be a political act. Okay, then we go back. We don't have Freire unless we, you know, we get the postmoderns. So we can talk about Derrida and Foucault. And then we can go back. John Dewey, he's the one that really messes up American education and it spreads. And then before him is Horace Mann, who in all of his brilliance is running the schools in Massachusetts, which is one of the only sort of organized school programs in the country at that time in 1850. He goes over to Prussia, says, wow, look at those obedient children as they're training for the military and brings that system back. You go, but you, but you don't have Horace Mann unless you go back to Kant, unless you, and then it all ends up at Plato. I mean, we can always just go back to Plato. Um, so, but it's a process and it's a slow little process that we see, but there are some of these minds that had, and, you know, I don't think, you know, John Dewey, maybe he was, maybe I'm being too kind, but I don't think he was like Mr. Burns from the Simpsons sitting at his desk doing this, thinking of how he could destroy children. It just happened to happen. And he was a product of his time with all of these philosophies coming out of Europe, the German philosophers, and they influenced um, so I don't think it's one person. It's not like the wizard behind the screen in The Wizard of Oz pulling the strings. I think it's just a progression that's happened. And it's just kind of ideas shifting and melding. But we're now, now here we are. So how do we like move that back? How do we push back? Well, you push back by taking your kids out of the system because the system is driven by money. No students, no money. End of story. The school choice movement that's going on in America right now, which people are thinking is wonderful, and it's, it is a step, but I think it's not the right step because you can then still send your kids, the money follows the kid, goes to private school, goes here, but those schools, like I was talking about accreditation, they still answer to the same body that's the center of the corruption in America, the Department of Ed. So you have to take your kids out 
Don't let them count your kids in this corrupt system. Take, pull the money. I don't know if it's happening everywhere, but I've seen, I've been kind of surprised when I've gone back to California. They're losing so many students who are now homeschooling that they have actually launched their own program, which you know is money driven because as yeah. long as they're still enrolled yeah. and I'm sure the, you know, the curriculum that they're using is, is just as bad as, as it is anywhere else. But it's, yes. you can yeah. see them adapting because they feel like they're, they're losing control. Well, during COVID, you know, when they first came back from COVID, when schools first started opening up, um, they still had very low enrollment. So what the districts did is that they passed policy to do uh, to use the numbers for the number of students pre-COVID. So they passed policy so they could use these old numbers pre-COVID so they could get the same amount of money that they did two years before. Well, it was crazy how much money the schools were given during that process. I mean, I have friends or teachers, they're just like... Yeah. It's embarrassing, but they're paying us all these bonuses and all this stuff to go to this the class because behind. They're, they're like, we have all this money that we have to use. Still now, the public yeah. schools have all this money that they're sitting on that were supposedly for COVID things. I yeah, mean, it was a can, huge it. boondoggle. Yep. The Chicago City Schools, $30,000 a student per year. And they can't read and they can't write. Yeah, I tutor. They literally can't read and write. There was a recent survey that showed that um, there were at least fifty schools um, in the Chicago area that had zero percent reading comprehension. Yeah, and I teach reading comprehension. I have students. I still teach um, some American students. I'm a private tutor for reading and writing. I have students attending top tier middle schools. Those schools are almost forty thousand dollars a year. And they hire me as a writing teacher because they're not learning writing in the school. Interesting. I teach reading comprehension to high schoolers. Read this passage. Let's answer these questions. What does it say? Where did you find that answer? No, that's not correct. Let's go back to the passage. Let's understand what you're reading. Yeah. I teach that to, you know, kids that should know. And they can read. They can look at the words. They can read aloud, but they can't understand what they're reading. They can't think about what they're reading. And that goes back to being indoctrinated, being a little kindergartner, being told if your dad throws a can in the trash can, go shame him. Yeah, it it's... all comes back to that for that type of education instead of doing it correctly. Yeah. And I guess I mean, I, I would say even at, at the, the schools that my kids went to, they would come home with, you know, some crazy idea and we would have a conversation at the dinner table and I would have them think through like, okay, let's play this out to the end. Like, where is this going to take you? And mm -hmm. so, but, but I felt like in that environment, it provided for enriching opportunities that they wouldn't have been exposed to those ideas if they weren't at the school. So I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. If it's, if it's too much, if they don't have the other side, but I, I do think that there is a place for them to have um, people with a perspective that's different than, than we have, just so we yeah. can have that. And I definitely clashing agree. But of the, the co-op is a great model for that. Yeah. Now in the States, a lot of co-ops, it's um, little sort of microcosms of people with the same thing. So it's everybody at this church, they're going to open up a co-op. That's not my model. My So for what we're doing, I am focusing on the Bitcoin community. We are a Bitcoin only company. I only take Bitcoin for um, our tutoring services. So that's the that's my audience is Bitcoin. That's the one constant. But if you start meeting a lot of Bitcoiners as you have, um, you notice there's a little, they have some different ideas. Not everybody is thinking the same way, maybe about this one aspect of their life, but not everything. Yeah. I mean, you have Bitcoiners that are on the very libertarian side politically. You have some Bitcoiners that are actually very, um, maybe, you know, very, I don't want to say woke, but maybe more environmentalist friendly. So you have the whole spectrum, right? You have, um, I'm an Egyptologist or I was, and so I believe the pyramids were built by human beings. And you have people who believe that the pyramids were built by aliens and we have some fun discussions. So we're not all the same. 
So, but that's my constant. But I think that if you get a group of Bitcoiners together to start putting a homeschool to, or a homeschool co-op together, then you're going to have some interesting ideas and some challenges and things like that. And if you want some non-Bitcoiner people in your homeschool co-op, if you want some local um, Salvadorian and have a bilingual co-op, I think that's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. You do what's right for you and the group that you're coming together. And that's kind of how it was for, for my kids through through junior high. They were part of a group that was, most of them were, were very different politically than us. I mean, we we're all like friends and got along well, but we're exposed to a lot of different ideas. And so, yeah, I think that that. And that's I, what I, my I, dissertation was on is the diversity of ideas. Yeah. I feel very strongly about it. And I, <clears throat> I, I want to commend you on that because what you're actually doing is, is um, understanding that your children um, are not clones of each other. You're you're getting uh, you're making time to get to know them and understanding what their needs are. So you've actually done a blend of um, of education styles. You know, you you put them through organized schools, but you've also done some homeschooling. You did what worked for them. Yeah, which is the whole I think point that um, that we believe in which is that uh, children are not clones. They, um, they're individuals, like we're all individuals. And, um, and going back to that idea of decentralization, that's what that means too. You, the, the whole um, point of all of this is to be able to have a system in which you can find your own solution and make your own independent judgment on what that means. So whether it is making um, financial decisions, uh, whether it's making uh, or being your own bank, that used to be a phrase that Bitcoiners like to throw around, being your own bank. Um, be your own education too for your family. And I, I think it comes from the same place. Now, um, what does it mean to be independent, to be able to think on your own so you can make these decisions? What does it mean to be able to uh, think critically. We like to t throw the term around uh, of uh, being able to think critically. Where does that come from? How do you develop that? Um, how do you? I, I well, first of all, I think it's it's something that is inexorably connected to curiosity. Um, this idea that um, a person um, or a student uh, can continue asking questions and feel like it's safe to do so, that's curiosity. Uh, to be able to just keep asking questions and not get slapped down. What happens in school, in a, in a normal classroom, to a child that asks too many questions? Well, I mean, even in the best of circumstances, even with a teacher that has the best of intentions, uh, one kid that asks a lot of questions is either going to be ostracized by the rest of the class or the teacher is just going to have to move on um, to the next subject because they have to hit their um, their milestones. So how do you make it safe for a child to keep asking questions? What we're trying to do uh, with our curriculum and, and our um, tutoring services is we're not inventing the wheel. We're not reinventing it. We're going back to a style of education that existed um, over 150 years ago. We, we just want to use the same classical education to, um, you, you talked about a liberal arts education. Um, we think that is fundamental to developing critical thinkers and curious people. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. I mean, these books are free online. You can go to Project Gutenberg. You just need a curator, somebody who can lead you through um, the just immense amount of classical material that's out there. Yeah. No, that's that's a good reminder because some, like you're saying, people think like, oh, well, the state just has to do it. And, and, and that's the problem yeah. because people, just like they feel like they can delegate their financial decisions to the existing centralized authorities, they think that they can also delegate the, um, the process of educating their child's mind. And of the two of these, what's more important to your, you know, the, the health of your family? I mean, if I had to pick one, I'd, I'd pick um, 
making sure that your child uh, is making sure that you maintain control um, and an understanding of what your child's needs are and to do it on your own terms rather than delegating that to the Department of Education. So I, I kind of skipped ahead earlier and I, I, I want to let you guys finish your your story <laughs> of right. coming down to El Salvador and and where Bitcoin comes to all this. And then we'll circle back and, and finish up on the educational front. So you're in Florida. When when did you guys become interested in Bitcoin? Was it something that happened together? Did one of you bring it? How, what's that story? Well, we kind of go way back on way this. Way back. And, uh, I, I like what's way back? Around 2011 era. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and whenever I say that, I think, oh, yeah, everyone's going to think that I have a lot of Bitcoin. No, <laughs> that is not true. Uh, and I, to my eternal shame, I didn't figure out how to buy it in or to acquire it in that era. So See, I was I was exactly the same. I loved, you know, as an Ayn Rand fan yep. that like I saw an article in the Wall Street Journal talking about this currency that government couldn't control mm -hmm. and it was decentralized. And I was like, this is fantastic. And then I tried to buy it and they were talking about holding your keys and, you know, you had to send money to some. I don't even know if Mt. Gox was open then, but it was like yeah. trying to figure out how to. So it took me like seven years to figure out how to even like acquire any Bitcoin. But right. Prob probably and I, similar and I keep to you. Thinking, I wish I tried harder, yeah. but so, but yeah. that's um, you know that's just the past. So we keep telling ourselves, "Yep, yeah, we could have done that, but we have to move on." You gotta and, look forward. You gotta just mm -hmm. keep going forward and try to. You know, I'm Pollyanna, an optimist. So I'm like, okay, don't look back. Just, just keep going forward. <clears throat> we got it. But, but but just to answer your question, we met in 2011, so 12 years ago. Okay. And um, one of the you know earliest dates. This sounds so nerdy. <laughs> one of the earliest dates that That's we why had. We're together. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, we we had that. We talked about it. I I talked to her about uh, about this thing this um, intangible magic internet money um, sitting on a park bench at the Huntington um, Gardens in Pasadena. My head exploded. I didn't know. I was just like, I don't like this. No, it's not safe. I'm going to run away. And um, I was like, let's let's talk literature again. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so we had a knowledge and interest um, of it uh, throughout the years. And we held on to, you know, whatever we were able to. I do remember <laughs> um, buying a laundry hamper from Overstock.com uh, back in the day. So with though, Bitcoin. With Bitcoin. Okay. And, um, and just I shudder to think about those decisions <laughs> at the time. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but even today, you know, we're, uh, we're in a circular economy here. We've gotten to know so many of the Bitcoiners. In the beach areas, you know, we get our meat from Owen at B um, Beefback Better. Uh -huh. We get our butter from Kiki and our pork from James. Um, and we use Bitcoin to buy it there and at the Bitcoin farmer's market. So, you know, whatever we're doing that now. So whatever I was thinking about my purchases at Overstock.com, I mean, if we're that right. Your, your, your mistake wasn't <clears throat> purchasing then. Your mistake was just holding fiat then right, you should yeah, have uh, exactly. just had everything in, exactly in Bitcoin. exactly yeah it took me a lot longer to come around i'm i'm usually a little slower like we joel mentioned el salvador when we left seattle i was like no i'm not ready um it took because me longer to be all in just, because you're a patriot of of what america used to stand for absolutely i'm a member of the daughter of the american revolution my family goes back to the mayflower I get emotional thinking about our constitution. I think it is an absolutely amazing to have a country for the first time in history founded on ideas. And I really, really love that. But just to fast forward why we're here, earlier this year in the spring when I realized that America was a banana republic and being a late antique historian, and knowing what's coming, there's an amazing series of Thomas Cole paintings where it's like the realms of civilization. 
And I fear that we're going to the last painting where civilization dies. That's America right now, and I can't watch. So we talked about it. And then I started thinking about the opportunity here, about being able to teach on my own terms, whether it's even online to a global audience, which I do, or whether it's to help families here make decisions about their education. I just knew that there would be, it would be more welcome here than what I was able to do in the States. Um, I even created a website. It's called lxed.com, El Salvador Expatriate Education. And I have every education that I could find researching, every option available for people who want to move down there. Just go to the site, check it out. I mean, it's, you know, I don't really update it right now. We'll um, make sure to put it in the show notes. Yeah, the... and um, I forgot to mention that, but it's basically, I just want to help people with this decision to move down here. If you feel trapped or if you have your family, you're like, I can't do it. I don't know how to educate my kids. Just reach out. I'll help you. I'll figure it out. Because that's really, I think, my calling. Yeah, I'm a homeschool advocate, but I know it's not for every family like you, you've kind of found it, but just be true to what your family needs. I think it's the most important thing of what I feel about. Yeah. So I'm curious as to what what was the, the straw that broke the camel's back as far as you thinking that US decline was, was inevitable and non-redeemable, and then what that set in motion and why El Salvador? Arresting Trump, whether, like I'm not the biggest fan, I have issues. But that was the breaking point where you're going after your political enemies. We are no longer a republic. We are a banana yeah. republic. And that did it for me. And make no mistake about this. We both despise that guy as um, as a character, um, as uh, and I've called him a sociopath. So that's going out on the Internet right now. But uh, but it's not about him. Yeah, it's about the principle and uh and that was her breaking point i i mean i feel like i've had earlier breaking points as well uh i think our breaking points may have been different but once we made that decision and came down here and met people then it became less about running away from america and seeing what amazing opportunities are here we're all in on this move we have uh, we've established our own company and we are registered with the Salvadoran government now, and, um, and and that's you know that's how we're going to do business. Yeah. So it's it's funny because that's that's kind of my feelings on on Trump. Also, I, I was always uh, I mean I voted for him because the alternatives were <laughs> yep uh, me too. But uh, but yeah, I was like, really, is this the best we can do? This narcissist that mm -hmm. um, I, I actually think he did a lot of good things, I but I just. Too can't stand him I, mean, it's I, I like oh i if couldn't he would agree just shut more up, it would uh it would maybe be okay yeah. but i can't believe that now we're gonna have uh biden and him most likely uh but like you're saying when they when they you know issued the the arrest warrant or whatever it was the how many times now he's been indicted the, i know i was like oh my gosh coming coming living in latin america for a long time you're like wow we are there like and it was, yeah. it seems quick, but if you're a historian and you look back and you do the recent history, you're like, okay, now I can piece together how all of this happened. COVID not only unmasked while everybody was masked, it kind of put everything into hyperspeed. And I think it happened a lot quicker because of COVID yeah. than it would have if that hadn't have happened. But I'm also of the mind that that was intentional. So I think it was put into play for a reason. I love that Bukele came out and he's like, imagine if I did this, if I arrested I, my political opponent, the, the people would go insane. I, insane right? uh, a and, plus Twitter trolling on uh, on Bukele. Oh, yeah. Or oh, no, oh no, nobody trolls like oh, like he's so good at it. Like Brilliant. he does. Yeah, I have. I, I won't mention him so he doesn't get in trouble. But I have a, a friend at the embassy and he, he told me one time he's like, yeah, we we can't even you know, try to, to play with him on Twitter because, you know, it takes us first a couple of days to get any response authorized. And then he just like demolishes us. So he's <laughs> particularly good oh, at man. trolling against the State Department. Yeah. 
Well, and everything he says is just so it's true. You're true. like, and it, how are you going to argue against this? Well, and America's making it really easy yeah. right now, too, I have to say. And this is someone who, you know, my dad was a patriot. I was brought up to be patriotic. Like I said, I, you know, I just love the documents. I love teaching them. Yeah. I'm still putting together, I'm putting together an American civics course. We're stopping around 1880. <laughs> Because anything after that, I don't want to talk about. But I think the founding documents are worth studying. They're brilliant. And um, so, yeah, I'm still, I still teach it. I still and, teach and them. And not just for uh, college age kids. I mean, yeah. you know, part of the reason that Deanna left is because you wanted to teach younger kids yeah. and get to them before they got their minds destroyed. Yeah, yeah you got to get them. And so, like right now, I'm teaching a small group in person in, uh, where I live on the beach area, and we focus on cursive, which is something I feel very strongly about. You know, teach your kid cursive before printing. There's studies about how it helps, um, like fewer cases of dysgraphia, dyslexia, because they're not lifting their pencil, and there's a fluid moment movement, the brain works better. Um, so we're, uh, they're learning cursive. I'm teaching Aesop's fables. They're reading Beatrix Potter. Um, and we're there learning, you know, about grammar. This is a noun. Circle all the nouns that you just read. And that's how I teach. It's a very, you know, traditional approach to all of these things. That's I, the beauty of it. And it's I mean, worked for how many centuries? I mean, yeah, exactly. We, we, we don't have works. to reinvent anything. Mm -hmm. It's all there. Yeah. It's just been forgotten. Well, and you look, we're, we're, <laughs> we're going backwards. Everybody can see that. Yeah. So maybe... Go back to what worked before. Uh, hoping, hoping. Yeah. yeah. You know, and a lot of some of the great minds were either homeschooled or self-taught. I mean, some of my heroes, Ben Franklin, Frederick Douglass, just from America, they're both self-taught, you know, very um, pulled their, you know, themselves up. They wanted to be educated. George Washington's another one. I mean, Thomas Jefferson went abroad. He was educated. But George Washington was self-educated also. He didn't have a lot of formal schooling. I think he went for a year. Um, so... Just do what they did. These were brilliant people that you can, you know, use as models, not only for what they accomplished as adults, but how they learned as children. Yeah. So you guys were in Florida. Mm -hmm. You're feeling like, okay, this is the end of, of the... Uh, the Republic. The Republic. <laughs> and because of Bitcoin, El Salvador seemed... But, but I like what you said that at first you were running from something and then once you got here, you're like, oh, wow, yeah. this is like actually running to something. There, yeah. so that, there's hope here. Yeah, we made the I, I made the decision <laughs> in April. Well, I mean, it is true that uh, I thought that it wasn't the end of the Republic by itself. I mean, it's but this is a the decline is on a continuum. Right. So. You know, and particularly living in Florida. Florida was fine. Florida's great. Yeah. I mean, I love DeSantis. But I mean, he's doing some amazing things. When we think about the opportunity of it, then it changes the calculations. Yeah. I also you in Florida and a lot of places you can't sling a cat without being in a military base. And if things went down, I didn't want to be there either. So I was looking a little forward of that. Yeah, um, that is a, a realistic thing to think about. Sl sling a cat. I've never heard. Oh, that, you've never uh, heard that. that That's an old before, expression. So. <laughs> and you know, in the beach area, we have a lot of stray cats. So, <laughs> um, so we decided. I decided in April, and I think the next weekend we had a, we started our first garage sale. So had you even been here before? No. Okay. So yeah. You're that, like, you just said, that's just how we we're roll. Going, yeah. We're like, we hadn't been, <clears throat> well, no, we did take a trip out to Florida to figure out where we wanted to live. But um, yeah, no, we're like, we're moving down We're just going to sell everything and move to a place we've never been before. Absolutely. Exactly. But one thing that really helped us was watching a lot of the YouTube people. Yeah. Like your channel was mm -hmm. very helpful. Um, Nikki and James. Nikki and, and James. And um, Ryan and Jessica. Yeah. Great. yeah so Jessica Francesco. Great. Francesco. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we felt like we, through their eyes and their experiences, we, in a way, kind of had been here. We, for some reason, we knew where we wanted to live. We wanted to be on the beach. There are days at my age that I wish we were up in the it's mountains hot. because yeah. it's hot. <laughs> and I, we're coming into the cooler time know, of the year. So I know. Today was great. hang in there another month or two. But, I mean, I dug in Egypt. I lived in Arizona. I yeah. lived in Florida. So I, I know what heat is. 
But when a woman gets a little older, it gets a little harder, I suppose, than when you're, well, you know. Not, not just a woman. I'm, I'm like, tell my wife, I'm like, I love the beach, but maybe we move to the mountains. It's, I know, uh, I'm like, Berlin's looking yeah. pretty interesting these days. The, well, especially at the high altitude in El Salvador, yeah. it is like so perfect because it never gets cold. Right. So you're like always between like 50 and 80 degrees, like, you That's know, perfect. like the low at night yeah. and the coldest time of year is maybe 50 degrees. And then, you know, maybe it pops out at 80, 85 during the day and you have that yeah. kind of. But even in Escalon, though, I mean, yeah. when we first landed here, that was the first place we stayed. And it we thought, oh, there. this is pretty temperate. And then um, the next place we stayed at was uh, at a, um, a an Airbnb in San Blas with no insulation on the roof. And no air conditioning in the main room. So yeah. I was huddled in like the little room with the bunk beds working because I was teaching and he was in the other room sweating. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, for for those who are looking to come to El Salvador and in the construction trade, specifically around insulation and how to build things come because you will have clients out the door. It's it, it's crazy. They build all these homes on the beach with so minimum if insulation all, I mean, yeah. and then the AC and electric is expensive. And so it's yeah, it's not yeah. It's not ideal. So I uh, married someone whose ancestors hail from tropical places and my ancestors hail from very northern Europe. So he won. Yeah. <laughs> he were at the beach. <laughs> but someday maybe we'll, you know, figure something else out. I don't know. Someday. But so you guys just hopped on a plane yeah. and came like we came in with June. all your stuff. Yeah, and we, that was we it. We came in June for three weeks and we found a place to live. And we explored some places. We spent some time in um, San Salvador. We started the paperwork for our business that trip. Okay. And then we went back to Florida for a few weeks, finalized things. We were going to ship a container because I wanted my books for the school. And that was a fiasco. Don't ship a container. That's what I always don't tell ship a people. Container. Don't ship a container we, and don't bring a car down. Yeah, we, we ended up losing um, some money on that. Venture. We now have all of our books stored in Houston. We're just trying to figure out how to yeah. get them down here. So little by little, um, I do have a hoping a good shipping company that we can do small boxes on occasion to bring the library down. But that'll take time. Um, yeah, this is um, it is a challenge to and anyone who's interested in coming here really needs to know that getting your stuff down here is not a trivial task. So. Uh, and we had heard that from other people, but we thought, well, we'll just research the hell out of it. I'm special. It's not going to be the same. Yeah. No, nope, <laughs> yeah, that's it's not true. true. It's yeah. really true. Don't ship a container. Um, either put your stuff in storage, do what we're doing. We bring, you know, we fly up and then we fly back business class. You get, yeah. you know, and that's just, it helps a lot. Yeah. And some of them you get 70 pounds. We get 70 pounds, and, two yeah. free bags, business yeah. class. The last time we did that, the business class flight was only like $80 more. Yeah. So no, you, it's, yeah. sometimes it's cheaper to do that than to pay for the extra Absolutely. Bag, so. And then you get the extra weight yeah. also. Um, so there's that. And I don't know, we're, we're figuring that part out. But then we came back at the end of July and we moved right into the house that we had leased. And we've been here since. Um, originally, I wanted to open the school, like I said, but things change and I'm trying to be flexible with that. So I'm now, if people in the area need, uh, want me to teach, they just tell me what subject, if I'm able to do it, we come up with the time and I can have a live class as long as it's small at my house. Uh, I'm teaching online. I still work with a center in the States, so I teach online there. Um, but I would rather pull back from that and teach more for the Bitcoin community. Um, I just want to help. And then I'm giving free webinars on how to get started homeschooling homeschooling meetups for families to meet and that's global they're online okay so anybody who's homeschooling and they're a bitcoiner they can meet and one of the reasons i'm also doing bitcoin is because of the woke ideology in education it helps filter definitely that's and def so definitely a filter because i'm a classical teacher we we've designed this amazing classical curriculum when we had our homeschool company it just I don't want people asking me to teach things that I don't think children should know. Yeah. Yeah. Homeschool um, or a woke homeschool. That's a thing. Oh, yeah. There's uh, a lot of them. Yeah. 
If you say you're secular because yes. you, you don't like we, I want to leave the religion to the families. I feel very strongly about that. I want the moral upbringing to be res- the family to be responsible, which is again, why you don't want your kids in American schools. And, but uh, so we teach the classics. I teach the three, well, two of the three R's reading and writing and history and those things, but I teach it from an objective point of view using primary sources. And so let, you know, I, any religion can come to my school. It doesn't matter or no religion, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, And that's how I think it should be in the way I want to teach. And because of that, because I don't want to influence, you know, what kids think, I don't want to send little Johnny home to shame dad. Um, The Bitcoin community is the perfect audience. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, I'd also just like to add that uh, when you um, when you use a classical curriculum, um, just going back to that idea of teaching a child how to think critically, using the classical curriculum, you have the um, the example of over twenty five hundred years of Western thought when you teach them in the form of um, the story of civilization, when you can explore um, the great thinkers, the great writers, the great philosophers and engineers and scientists of, of history, you get examples of how to think critically. I don't think, and I, I think this is, um, this may be a controversial statement, but I don't think you can teach a class on critical thinking because it's too abstract. You can't, uh, you know, I, I remember taking symbolic logic in college and that is pure abstraction. And what that does is, is you know, when, you, when you're teaching abstract syllogisms, what you're doing is, is teaching the, uh, the student to, um, to disassociate logic from the practicality of their life. So instead, what you should do, in, instead of staying up here yeah. at, at that high abstract level that has nothing to do with your real life, show the great examples throughout history, not just the philosophers. I mean, I, I think teaching Aristotle's ethics is a great, um, um, you know, a, a great part of any curriculum, but teach them the great stories too. You know, what we can learn so much from reading those Greek plays or Shakespeare because they show all these examples of human behavior and you in the, you know, in, in the sort of wrapping of an engaging story, you're also absorbing human behavior. And you can see, you know, when, um, in life, a student, a child is going to look at that friend who's whispering in their ear that their, um, this other person is trying to backstab them. They'll think, Oh, that's Iago from Othello. I know this guy. I've read about him. And that's what, that's the great gift that these, um, uh, this kind of a classical education can give to anyone. Well, and it's, it's so incredibly needed. I think we saw that during COVID. I was just amazed at the people that I know that are, that are smart, like, but they couldn't put logical, things together. So you would try to engage them and understand where they're coming from and how, you know, they're saying that if you weren't wearing a mask, you were causing it. And so you would try to like, okay, let's, let's talk through this and see what you're saying. And it didn't matter to them that one thing didn't line up with that. And in my mind, I can't hold, I can't hold two things that conflict with each other. I just, I have to make, but most people I realize that's not a problem for them. They can no. hold whatever the truth they're told to hold, even if it's in conflict with everything else they know, and it doesn't cause any like dissonance. And and I mean, it, that it's, was mind boggling for me. It is, and it's like siloing your mind, right? You have these little places that are individual, but nothing connects. They don't connect. No. You're like, how can you hold that because and that? Because they destroyed those kindergarten brains. <laughs> it's true. I mean, uh, if it didn't happen to them by an educator, it happened somehow. Um, now, I mean, I think it, there is a possibility that some people are are born with um, cognitive deficiencies that keep them from putting these um, principles, these conflicting principles 
together. But, um, but for the most part, I think a normal human being is going to have that ripped out of them at an early age if they graduate to adulthood and still have that deficiency. It's, yeah, you know, I remember being a kid and I was the Y child from hell, I can say. My, my poor mother, I look back and I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, she was very patient, but I was always asking why, but why, but why? And I remember, you know, in school being told, oh, okay, that's interesting. Go, you know, that's here, have some extra stuff. I went to a public school. I mean, I'm old, so it was in the 70s where they would do that. The teachers would give you extra handouts, would give you extra work. That doesn't really exist anymore. Um, now they just want you to shut up. Yeah, yeah, they just want you to be quiet. But I mean, I remember being told in some classes. I remember being told in church because I was learning about Adam and Eve the same time I was learning about the dinosaurs and wondering, OK, who came first? I asked in class and I was told to go ask my parents an appropriate response. I asked in church and I was told that it was blasphemy and to go sit in the corner. So I sat in the corner. But that shuts yeah, brains down. Yeah. It didn't shut my brain down. I probably, I mean, well, I actually know I just went home and cried because that's how I dealt with things, tears. But luckily, my mom really helped, you know, engage our minds in curiosity and took us to the library and took us to museums, things like that. Those acts alone, just getting books, not on the screen if possible, but I know we live in the digital age, but, you know, getting kids reading, no matter what, just get them reading because they're going to expand their vocabulary. I shouldn't say no matter what. Get them reading classics. It's going to expand their vocabulary. They're going to learn how to interact with other humans. Just have them read, 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 read. And I think that's also missing, particularly with this emphasis on STEM, which within the Bitcoin community, as you've mentioned, is a thing because it's yeah. very technological. Yeah. But without that, you, without that reading, the humanities. You don't know the why of you what don't, you're doing. Yeah. And you can't think and you can't connect things. Yeah. So even as an engineer, you need to be able to think and think on the fly and have that brain work. And in order to do that, reading classics is one of the best things you can do for children. And then you'll learn how to be articulate about what the value of it is. So you might, uh, without it, only be able to um, express the thing, uh, the, whatever it is that you're working on, whatever technological progress uh, process or uh, engineering process you're going through, but to be able to articulate it for somebody else, even if you just um, need a job at a software company, how are you going to write that email? How are you going to be able to say to to be able to think through what are the um, where are the ways that this can go badly? Um, how do you use words to express the various outcomes? And you can't do that unless you have this wide breadth of experience through education. No, I agree 100%. And that's why, you know, I'll get into arguments sometimes with people in the Bitcoin <clears throat> space because they, I think some of them are a little short-sighted and they want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because mm -hmm. we've seen uh, a lot of the, the liberal arts education go in this woke direction. They want to get rid of it all instead of reclaiming it. I can't blame them for that because that's what they see. Yeah. But we can't give up on the the real value of the liberal arts. That's what led to the Renaissance. That's what and it could lead to another Renaissance if we rediscover it. It also helped in the Enlightenment. Yeah. It formed the basis, this this awakening of great ideas that were that were dormant from the ancient world. It led to the belief that it was possible to know things and it it led to a um, basically a cultural self-esteem movement the belief that it was okay to pursue knowledge which then led to the enlightenment and this amazing flowering of scientific um knowledge of, um you know but that came from the belief that it was okay to explore the universe instead of of um restricting yourself because it went against doctrine. Yeah. So primary sources are a great way to do it. Don't don't go order a textbook from Amazon or a bookstore. Go to primary sources. Um, and 
for instance, I was working with a fifth grader in Seattle, and he was reading translations of Copernicus and understanding them. He was curious. He loved the stars. And so I'm like, well, let's see if you can read this. So I was helping him with his reading, his comprehension. We talked a lot about it. I helped break down the concepts. But I remember um, his mom telling me that she was explaining something to him. And he's like, oh, yeah, that was like Copernicus. And she almost fell over. <laughs> and that's the thing. That's, we we underestimate that that. kids so much because of the standards that we think are acceptable today. The, what what the norm is. The norm is a lot higher. Oh, my gosh. Education. So I have a very, at a very large library, and then I had a large library. Now I have a medium library with all the moves. But I love old school books. Mm -hmm. And to look at what they were learning in 1870 versus what they're learning now, you would think it would be off the charts. Even the arithmetic, the level of arithmetic for second and third grade has slid so much. It's amazing to see the decline in education and the standards. But as you know, human beings have not changed in terms of their potential. Um, so all we need to do is to go back to those standards and um, and not not sell them short because of what the the norm is today. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious. I want to go back to uh, what you said earlier about you know you that you studied the the decline of Rome and that. <laughs> Here's someone who thinks about Rome. That, yes, I do. I'm a, yes. I'm, a, so, I, I'm a woman and I think about Rome. So, uh, you know, let, give me give me the the five minute uh, or three minute. Like what what is it that you see from from your study of the fall of Rome and what you see happening in the U.S.? What are the parallels? What are the, the things that you find most concerning? You know, can we have these resurgences like Rome did where they had <clears throat> times where they, you know, they kind of came back from the brink and had periods where there was kind of a rebirth or. So the fall of Rome is not one thing, first off. So um, Edward Gibbon, I had to read all of it. And when I was in grad school studying history and um, it's very complex, it's not one thing. So yeah. you have a new religion moving in that mirrors Christianity moving in, right? The new religion is woke. You can say it's environmentalism. They have their idols. They have their gods. It's all Marxist. Just pick your particular deity, right? So there's that. So that has moved in and it is pushing out the old, which interestingly, Christianity, those sort of values, right? It's pushing out the ideas of the founding of America. So that's going away. And, and just as a parallel to that, um, there was a destruction of idols of the old order, the, the smashing of statues uh, that took that took place then and is taking place now. Yeah, Alexandria was the hub of learning for the classical world. And they had statues devoted to them and they were destroyed. They tumbled down just like we see statues today. Um, so that's, okay, one parallel. Finances. Okay, so you, Rome with their economy, um, they debase their economy. They start shaving off the coins. Even the Greeks did that. But anyway, um, so you have that, you have the financial major financial issues. When Rome, um, Cleopatra chose the wrong guy from the triumvirate and she went with Mark Anthony, but Caesar defeated him. So when that Egypt fell to Rome at that point, became part of the Roman Empire, it was called the breadbasket of Rome because there was so much grain there. Plus it had a lot of gold and other natural resources, Cornelian and other things, that it fed Rome. They pretty much just destroyed that. So they they weren't able to, you know, have their breads and circuses, which is how they kept their people happy, right? You feed them and you entertain them. So you have the decline of the economic order. So we're seeing that. I mean, how much money has been printed in the last five years? I mean, that hurts. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> you ch choked him up over I there. know. We get an emotional response. Seriously. So, um, so you have the economic decline, massive economic decline in America. You have the spiritual side. You also have the sexualization, and we see this in ancient Rome too, where it becomes very hypersexualized. 
And, and anything goes. And anything yeah, goes. Push right. the boundaries. Right. Yeah, you know, and, and that starts, I mean, we see Nero doing that. So that had been going on for quite a while. You have the Bacchanal festivals and all of that, right? And it goes really far in Rome. By the way, Camille Paglia, the, uh, the great academic um, writer, wrote a book called Sexual Persona, which documents evidence of the fall of these great um, empires being preceded by um, sexual deviancy, or at least the blurring of gender identity, yeah, which is amazing. I mean, and she wrote this book like a couple decades ago. What What was the author again? The Camille Paglia. Okay. What was the, the title? And the, the book is called Sexual Personae. Okay. I'll we'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so there's that. You have the religion. You have the economics. You have that. And then you also have influence from outside. I don't know. It's kind of strange. There's no border on the south part. So you have people almost just coming in all the time. Kind of like you had in Rome. So things like that. Um, and, and I just want to add that... <clears throat> All of these are symptoms of um, a deeper issue of what I think of as a cultural self-esteem. Yeah. The belief in your own greatness. I mean, if you have, um, as Rome was considered to be the great city uh, of the ancient world, that there were the, the people that inhabited Rome and even the, the people who considered themselves Romans thought that it was uh, great. And they had esteem for their culture. And they wanted to be a part of it. They were yeah. building it was, something. It meant something to be yeah. roaming. That citizenship meant something, just like at one point American citizenship really meant something. And that's the parallel. There is a decline in cultural self-esteem, the belief in your own exceptionalism. And we all see this is uh, the intelligentsia from... Uh, from writers to journalists to, to professors in academia to Hollywood movie stars, they never miss an opportunity to um, to attack uh, American greatness. And I mean, there is greatness. Uh, a lot of it is legitimately gone yeah. <laughs> because of of what's happened over the past 100, 150 years or so. But what they're attacking is what legitimately is good about America. Uh, it's um, its constitution. It's um, you know its belief in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what they attack. They attack it for its virtues. And they attack the great minds that have come mm -hmm. out of America. I mean, think of the end of the 19th century. I mean, some of really innovative ideas came out of that time period. Uh, tech in the modern world is a good equivalent. But you can no longer, and with reason on some of the tech moguls these days, but you, you, know, you can't recognize somebody for what they contribute. You have to figure out ways to tear them down. And that's the value. It's, America has become what is like, you worship the victim. Whoever is the highest victim wins. And there's a part of Rome that's almost like that too, um, where it the pride, the being Roman, the idea of this great classical past, it goes away. The great art yeah. goes away. The great buildings, you know, Trajan's, you know, forum and all of these things, you know, they go away. They don't do those big building programs. The shift the momentary yeah, pleasures. Right, and, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's what it is. It's like in the moment and you can't recognize greatness. And you see a decline. I mean, High time preference. Yeah. I well, mean, no, after that's, Marcus that's, Aurelius, you don't really get anybody that's even, no one remembers any of the other emperors. And, and, and I, I just want to emphasize that point about high time preference uh, versus low time, pre time preference. These are all um, cognitive issues. The ability to think ahead, to plan, to to not realize a value and defer your um, your you know what what you get out of your actions uh, requires a high state of cognitive ability, and there's no um, coincidence that that's what is destroyed in young minds in today's education system. 
that's, and I, I actually think it's intentional because the adults that are doing the teaching are threatened by independent minds on an, a deep rage filled emotional level. So they look to not just stamp it out whenever they see it in a classroom, but to also devise um, pedagogical techniques to stamp it out under the, the guise and under the, the window dressing of high minded concepts like, um, you know, like DEI or, uh, or framing things in an oppressor versus oppressed ideology. These are all examples <clears throat> of the same kind of pedagogy that's intended to stamp out these minds who can then be able to think um, long term. And so, um, and so this is something that happened um, to some extent in Rome as well, because as your cognition declines, you, you will react emotionally. You won't be able to reason and, and be able to see um, long-term value anymore. So, so you'll react in the exigencies of the moment. And that will either be um, pleasure or in most cases, it'll be rage. Because when you lose the ability to plan ahead, your plans are going to not succeed. And when they don't succeed, you'll just act out like children do. Well, and that's, I mean, <clears throat> especially through COVID, I, I saw it because right. I would try to engage people on Facebook or different things. Like I wanted to really understand, like, where are you coming from? Do you think it's good that our schools are shut down or that you're, you know, threatening people with jail or losing their jobs if they don't get vaccinated? And these were not like stupid people. These were highly educated people, but they would react emotionally mm -hmm. and they would just like start calling you names. And I'm like, hey, I... I I really want to understand, but they didn't have a reasoned like thought process behind it. It was totally emotional. And it, for me, it was hard because you, know, you expect that from people that maybe are not that smart, but a lot of these were very intelligent, highly educated, and they were able to like persist in this state of not reconciling these things in a logical way. And, but like you said, they were like kids, emotional, yeah. like I'm gonna take my ball and go home Another, because you're not agreeing with me on this. It's tantrums, that's what it is. So many of them. I know. And there's, there's a certain point in any person who tries engaging on a logical level on any kind of social media where you just, you understand, oh, that I'm not, I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to, to um, tease out um, an underlying real truth by using um, an identification of facts with logic to put it all together and to connect the dots. But you're not playing that game. No, they're playing by a whole different set of rules. Like yeah. I won because I called you a racist or right. a whatever, exactly. whatever term they throw out there that you're like, wait, wait, what? Where did, where did that come from? We were talking about like a virus a sickness this is like a scientific discussion but it's yeah it, it was, then there, it was and there's a point at which it's not anymore yeah. it's not a uh, that kind of a discussion it's actually an expression of fear i mean they're raging because they have an undefined fear that they can't get any kind of satiation from and so they're acting out and anyone who tries to to dissuade them make them let go of their fear because it's such a part of their identity. Anyone who goes against that is the enemy. And then the only, because they don't have reason any longer at that point, they've given that up or had it beaten out of them. Then the only thing that they can do is rage. I remember reading an article talking about how once people stopped wearing masks, how hard it was for some of these people to let it go because they had like, no, that's how they identified. You're the bad person. You don't have a mask on. I'm the good person. Like that is how I show you how virtuous I am. And yeah. and now that didn't work for them anymore. And they were like in this like spiral. And it was it was so. But even then, they still couldn't no. see how. I am not it was. looking forward to going back to Seattle, which we have to do. But I am not yeah. looking forward to it because that's still there. My sister, I talked to her last week, and she said that people are starting to mask again because of the new variant. <sighs> I know. 
Smile therapy. That's all I'm going to do. See, like, this is smile therapy. And we won't even go. I mean, the, we could have another entire podcast on what the masking did to children and their oh cognitive gosh. development. Don't even get me started. So much. Well, we'll have, so we'll have to have you back on just to talk about that. Because that's something that I, I think is critical. Like, it's even, horrific. that's what I always tell people. Even if the masking did help with the spread, which it seems very much that it didn't, but even if it did, nobody considered the cost and you should always weigh the cost benefit of things. But mm -hmm. it was like, you even brought it up. It was, oh, you're trying to kill my grandmother. And it was like, there's <clears throat> always with any drug, with any treatment, we always weigh, okay, there's, there's side effects, there's negative repercussions do those outweigh the benefits, yeah. then we don't do it. But with COVID, it was like we threw everything, everything out the window. Everything went away. Every rational thought on how to deal with it went away on every level. It, you know, except for, you know, us down here. Just, no, just and, insane. <laughs> just insane. Yeah. Well, I hope we, the last um, two minutes doesn't get this uh, podcast demonetized <laughs> for you, though. But. Well, that that's okay. We we don't worry about those things. We okay. just we just say uh, we say whatever we want and uh, let the chips fall, as they will. Um, that's why we moved here. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, just just to add to that, uh, we were at a Bitcoin meetup the other day, and uh, we met a fellow, a middle aged guy from Canada with his wife. We were just coming down here to check the place out, and the conversations were just like this, uh, just far reaching deeply um thoughtful but but he just kept saying unbelievable i can actually talk and not have to censor myself and of course he's from canada so talking the way you you want could get your bank account frozen yeah. but it was um it was really uh, amazing to see that in action from someone who's not here because we're starting to get used to it yeah yeah, you take it for granted here, and then We're you see already, even a you few can months. see people. They're kind of weighing like, uh, "What can I say?" Or uh, you know, know you like, do the little yeah, dance. They're doing their self censorship, and some of the people <laughs> still, even though they're living here, they're working for tech companies Got that they it. still have to like, "Hey, don't put that on the air, or don't I'll lose my job," or I'll, they're still, even though they're living here, there's repercussions from that. Which that was eye opening for me. I didn't yeah. realize how stifling and how much self censorship was going on in that community. That's really surprising too. That's interesting. Yeah, That's, I mean, I mean it's rampant. We formed our own company and I'm an educator. I'm used to self-censoring. I mean, I when they said we had to start putting our syllabus online, that's I was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to be found out because I'm teaching those evil classics, those old dead white guys. I'm going to be out of here anyway. Uh, so I am curious with what you're trying to do, and I'm wondering if you have any clarity on El Salvador's, um, the legal standing of, of homeschooling, because I've been told that it's not recognized by the government, that it is, not that it's illegal, but it's not um, it's not recognized. You, you will very rarely find a Salvadoran family that's that's homeschooling it's and usually if they do it's it's you know they're english speaking or there's a right. there's a connection with the expat community um i know generally for expats they kind of leave them alone and let them do whatever they want but do you have any maybe you know more than i do on that so i've actually talked to a salvadoran woman who was homeschooled and she said they never bothered her it, they never even said anything to the family she's like oh yeah anybody can do it they just kind of leave you alone um, I think it should be recognized. I feel strongly about that. I think all families should be able to educate their children the best they see fit. And I know why there's pushback. I mean, child trafficking alone, right? However, there's child trafficking in, you know, all around the world. It's a, I don't even, it just makes me want to cry and my blood boil. But there are ways, there are policies that can be put in to, in, you know, make sure that there are, you know, things that are taken, you know, into consideration, checking in on families and things like that. You can also have cultural mores and they go a long way. I mean, look what happened with us not masking, walking down the street in Seattle. Cultural mores go a long way. It didn't affect us, but in general, yeah, you know, you we couldn't have people over because in Seattle, our neighbors would have called the cops and we would have gotten fined. 
So even then we had to just hunker down and no one could come over. Cultural mores, right? That's a really good way, but that's shifting the culture. It takes time. But I think it should be legal everywhere. I think letting a family educate the children the best they see fit. No one knows their kids better than the parents. But I, I do want to add, though, that the reason that um, the framing of this discussion is centered around the belief that only an authority or an authority um, or some kind of centralized agency can properly have oversight on parents who would be uh, who would probably do their children harm if the centralized authority weren't um, uh, overseeing everything. And so we see that in in most of uh, Latin America, in Europe, in most of the world, really, homeschooling is legal. And no. I mean, it's legal or illegal. 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 Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 Illegal. Yeah. Yeah. Illegal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I'm slurring. <laughs> but um, but that comes from this belief that only the centralized authority can determine what's good, and the parents are potential harm yeah. causers. Right. This is not an idea that existed 150 years ago. It was unthinkable. I don't think it really fully existed even 100 years ago. Yeah. I mean, this is a modern thing. Yeah. You know, and we have. I mean, every, I'm an anthropologist, right? So I can talk about taboos, <clears throat> mores. These things keep cultures in check. We have taboos. You don't marry your cousin. We have these things in place. And it keeps things in check. So why don't we extend that to the protection of children? And, and that's historically how it was. It's exactly yeah. and, how it and, was. But over the course of the 20th century, after the progressive movement took hold in, in all the universities, which then began to influence the culture, there was this belief that these social mores weren't enough. The only an, a centralized authority could um, could regulate everything. And um, and that is just yet another um, example of of this belief in the delegation of your own sovereignty to some centralized authority. It's just, an, it's, you know, just like the creation of the Federal Reserve was a delegation of um, financial, um, you know, your own financial sovereignty. Um, so too is this idea that um, only these recognized authorities um, can probably, uh, uh, can possibly oversee the behavior of parents for their own children because the parents will cause harm otherwise. It's the infantilization of um, an entire population. Yeah, no, 100%. Well, why don't we uh, wrap up on that, but I wanna make sure that people know what services you guys offer and, and please make a distinction between people that are here in El Salvador um, versus people that wanna do something remotely. And then what type of things you guys have in the future is like what your goal is, is to, to push these educational alternatives in El Salvador. Um, so we teach, uh, we tutor online. We're doing on demand right now. So if you have a student or a group of students that want to take one of our classes, our website is lyceumtutoring.com. You can look through all the classes. You can fill out a form and request us to teach a class. We'll come up with a time that works for everybody. Um, so that's, you know, for the international or even local that wants just to have online. Yeah. It's sort of like a virtual, yeah. um, homeschool so, co-op. But it's live. I mean, it's me sitting there and we have very small group classes, no more than six students at a time. Um, so you can have one, two to three or four to six. So but if you, if you're able to share a class with, um, with other students, uh, with multiple students, then the price goes down yeah. significantly. Yeah. And we charge by class. Most classes are four to 12 weeks. Okay. So it's not a regular full school year. You sign up for a class. I like this a la carte education, particularly because we want to support homeschoolers. So maybe you have a kid who's interested in Western civilization, fascinated by ancient Greece and Rome. Okay, so sign him up for our early Western Civ class. Sign him up if he's in high school for our philosophy class on ancient Greece and Rome and maybe the art history class. So let them, you know, that's the Charlotte Mason way where you just pick <coughs> one subject and you do everything in that one topic. Um, so we have those on-demand classes. I also offer free how to get started homeschool webinars. 
Those are you can find on the website also. So you can sign up for a free webinar. I offer free consultations, like 15 or 30 minute consultation if somebody wants to just have a chat. And that extends to just educational opportunities here in El Salvador. I want to help anybody in particular, Bitcoiner or somebody interested in moving to El Salvador, make that transition easier for them. Because that's a huge concern when people are looking to move. It is it one is, of the biggest the, concerns. It is probably the first. The second is how they're going to get their pets here. But the, <laughs> the first one is like, okay, how are we going to educate our Right, our and kids? there are opportunities. Yeah. I mean, you have the international schools. You have some, you know, schools up in the city, the main, you know. There are even some schools in Santa Ana, some of the other regions. I have that website, which will be in the show notes, lxed.com. It lists all those things. Um, there's Montessori schools here. So there's the whole gamut, not the whole gamut that you would get elsewhere, but there's a lot, a lot of, op of options. A lot of options. Yeah. And I think that a great thing to do would just be to reach out to Deanna and use her services as a coach to, um, you know, just as an ongoing thing, if you decide to make that move to homeschooling your kids, um, she's really good at showing you curriculum that you can use um, just as a curator. Uh, there's there's a lot of stuff out there. It's it can be overwhelming, uh, but uh, she's worked with a lot of families over the what is it now seven years? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, and I I think that uh, you can't understate how important that is because it can be overwhelming. You can do things in a way that really you're going to regret later. And so I think to work with somebody who understands it and what I've seen is people who don't go into it with a lot of forethought and aren't making sure that their kids have transcripts and those right. sorts of things. Then later they get into a situation where their kid can't go on to a four-year university because they don't have transcripts and it kind of limits their opportunities. So if you know those things going into it and maybe you still make that decision, that trade-off, but at least you like go into it with your eyes wide open. Absolutely. And so I can help with transcripts. I can help with curriculum. Um, I can do custom. I also have um, guides. I've worked with um, parents who want to do their own writing and teaching, but they're like, I don't know how to write an essay. So I actually teach the parent how to, you know, write, how to grade an essay. So there's a lot of things, you know, with my years of teaching, being a private teacher, being a homeschool teacher, that I can help families. And I don't have like one size fits all. I don't believe in that. So yeah. everything is custom. I have conversations, find the needs, and then we put something together. I even do that for my students for the SAT prep, right? What are your needs? Are you great? You you don't need anything with the um, synonyms. You're great with analogies. Fine. We're not going to cover that. I'll put a few things in there just to refresh. But I custom do everything because every child is different. Every family is different. And if I just said, okay, here's my thing I offer and then try to fit people in there, it's not going to work. So everything I do or we do really is designed for that individual or family. Yeah, she has um, a 20th century American history class taught through the use of comic books. You know, how um, how the the comic books illustrated what was going on in the country at the time. It goes, it's it's that kind of customization. Yeah. There's, yeah. It's all over the map. The question is, why could Captain America punch Nazis, but then we get into the modern era and we're apologizing to our enemies? <laughs> <sighs> That's fun. So, so there's uh, there's lyceumtutoring.com, there's lxed.com, but Deanne is also a great follow on Twitter. Okay, what's your Twitter handle? At Dean Paris 2012, okay. D-I-N Paris 2012, like Paris, the city, like the city. Like the city. Okay. Yeah, her name's um, not classic. Like, not like the city in Texas, the no. city, no. Yeah, it's in, the city France. in France. Yeah. Spell the same. Yeah. Are they civil the same? Yeah, they, okay. the, no, oh, I think one Texas two R's. -E yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now we'll confuse everybody. I know, right. yeah. D in Paris, <laughs> Deanna in Paris, because when I have that handle, um, I Paris is my favorite city, so I always wanted to be there. I don't know if I want to be there today. I'm happy in El Salvador. <laughs> but so D in Paris 2012 is my Twitter handle. It's classical educator is what you'll see. And if you want to follow me, I'm also on Twitter. Um, we share the D in Paris uh, account. Um, so we'll, I, I do a little more long form tweets on there. But if you want to follow me trolling on politics, I do trade. Um, my uh, handle is TraderJoel.com or uh, at TraderJoel. Yeah. At TraderJoel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. He's much more political. I'm all about education. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, 
love that the, the we're able to get this information out there because I know this is the type of stuff that people moving to El Salvador are concerned about. And so to have this as a resource for them to be able to connect with you. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm a little upset with you guys that you weren't here seven years ago. And, you know, I had to go through this all on my own. But uh, for everybody else. Grandchildren. Yeah, yeah. But like I said, hopefully that's a while still. <laughs> don't, don't rush that. Um so well, I would like to have you back on though. At some point, I would love to to have a. I don't know if people want to listen to it or not, but I would love to have the discussion about how the masks impacted just the development of young people because I've oh, seen a yeah. lot of the the negative repercussions. So there's a we, lot of data. We we will leave that for another day. Yeah. Um, but thank you guys. And, You're welcome. Uh, Thanks yeah, for having us. Our on. pleasure. We'll, yeah, we'll make sure we do it again. I could talk about this all day long. <laughs>